All right. Hello, 14 as Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is February 4th, 2021. And today, guys, we are just going to spend some more time digging. Uh, we're going to spend probably the bulk of our time or the second half of our time, if you will, um, in the book of Ezra. Probably I'd say the, the bulk of our time will be in the book of Ezra. You know, for a long time, I until recently, until the past, just the last few months here, I had really been thrown off by the book of Ezra and and Cyrus. You know, we've been told for so long that Trump is Cyrus and Trump is Cyrus. And before my ministry, before I had understood what was happening and everything changed for me in September 2017, I, 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 we had already been told that Trump was Cyrus and Trump was Cyrus and he was going to do these things. But in the past several months, we've come to know that he clearly isn't Cyrus. Um, you know, we don't know who Cyrus is yet, so I won't say clearly. Maybe there's something that happens um, and he becomes the one to declare this, this peace uh, over in Israel. And, and, you know, maybe there's still something there because, I, so I don't want to say he's not, but not in the sense that the way the world thought he was, that the way the church was telling us or trying to tell us that he was when he was, all right, back in 17 and in 2018. And the reason they were telling us was, I mean, it, it made some sense. We know he's been working on the peace deal for so long behind the scenes for decades. You know, he really wanted to get that deal done. Um, we know during his presidency, Israel turned 70. Right. So so how are we not to be caught off guard with these things or 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 caught up in these things in believing that maybe it really was possible that he was Cyrus? Because everything we have come to know and everything that that's the foundation of this ministry. And I don't mean just the Gospels and the 14 years and so forth. I mean, the foundation of of what makes this ministry the truth and its foundation is the 70th year. So when when Trump was president and they were turned Israel had turned 70, you know, of course we were all looking and expect, expecting that hey, there's going to be something happen, Trump's going to declare the peace deal, we're gone. Israel 70. Everybody's saying Trump is Cyrus. Right? But in the past several months there's some very very key pieces of information that help give us greater understanding now of the book of Ezra, as well as showing that the true 70th isn't the 70th as we thought it would be. You know, <laughs> why would it be, right? It would just be too simple, wouldn't it? The Lord has put all these things and mysteries to be revealed. And, you know, we've been so blessed by receiving so many of these mysteries being revealed, <laughs> right? And so it's, it's really fascinating, but you know, we say it's a mystery, but it's a mystery in the sense that it, it it wasn't maybe properly understood, but it was always in scripture. Right? It was always in scripture. So we've we've realized lately that of course it couldn't have been Trump because the timing of when Trump was in power didn't make sense. Could he still be later? Sure, but I'm talking in the sense like I said a moment ago when he was in power and the connection to when the, the world of church was saying it while he was in power and while Israel was quote unquote believed to be in their 70th, which clearly made sense on a, on a worldview within the calendars. But we know Leviticus now, right? And we came to know this by, by a, a study we had done to say, wait a second, we're missing something. You see, I decided, I had this idea that I would count all of the Sabbaths. And I just, I did it in my head and I started counting. And I said, well, if we did every seven years, every seven years from this connection to Christ's birth and when the Sabbath would have been, there would have been 289 Sabbaths to the end of 2020, which is the spring of 2021. So Right now, we're really in the 70th year. And what had happened was 289, we did a study and, and I did some research and the, the 
Gregorian word, the Greek word, I should say Gregorian, the Greek word 289 was used once in Scripture, once in Luke's Gospel. And the word it was connected to was the three years of the tree and its bearing fruit and so forth. And it's the only time that word 289 was ever used. That to me is a revelation. Because as you look at this 70th, and we came to realize we're in this 70th, means we're at the final tail end right now of the seventh year in a Shemitah year or in a Sabbath year cycle. You see the seven years? And then what's the tribulation? There's seven year time frame of seals, seven year time frame of trumpets, and then the last year is going to be the Jubilee. Well, this all lined up. So that was how I took it back and went all the way back to when Jesus was born, when he was a little kid and did all those Sabbaths. This gave us a huge piece of revelation. But what ended up happening is we said, well, wait a second. We got a three-year gap. And, and our, our brother Ivan did this for me, right? It was, I was so excited to be able to see it on paper. And so what we have is there was this three-year gap. So from 1948 to 1951, you had from 48 into 49 is one, from 49 into 50 is two, from 50 till the spring of 51 is three. So you had this three-year gap that we were trying to account for. And when I did this study to see the Greek word, it turned out it was talking about a three-year period that was relating to trees. It was awesome. And so lo and behold, a brother sends us a, an email in, in our forum on our website. And he posts the comment to say, hey, go look at Leviticus 23. And it says, when you shall come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then shall you count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised three years. So you're talking about all manner of trees for three years. The, the Greek word 289 was three years, and it was talking about the tree. And it says, and it shall be uncircumcised unto you. It shall not be eaten of. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to be praise, uh, to praise the Lord with all. So boom, now at the fourth year, everything is ready. It's now there to be the Lord's. Okay? So there was this really, really cool connection going on. And when you count this, <laughs> it could seem confusing at first. You know, I was talking, I think it was my wife. I, I believe it was my wife. Maybe one of you guys I, I talked to sometimes. And I was talking about the differences and how it can seem confusing. You know, here's one, for example, when you're counting uh, years. Uh, Israel is the timepiece. This is a good one. If you go to Psalms 90 and 10, and it says from 70 to 80, well, people think 70 to 80. Well, that's 10 years. It is 10 years. If I was just counting numbers, one, two, three, four, and I said count from 70 to 80, Nobody ever starts counting from 70, right? You'd say 71, 72, 73. So 10 years begins at 71, and it ends at the end of 80. It's like not saying 80, but 80 is like the end of the 80th year. So right before it would turn to the spring of 31, when it would turn 11, okay? Or when the number would, would hit 11 and you'd be in the 11th year. And it seems confusing to people because when I was talking to, I think it was my wife, like I said, it's, you know, I was born in 1979. Well, it was the 1900s. But what do they call it? It was the 20th century. So even though it was the 1900s, it was called the 20th century. We're living in the 2000s now, but it's called the 21st century. So there's always these, there, there's two ways of looking at things, right? It's like being in the womb before you're born. Some say, some cultures will say, well, you're a year when you come out of the womb. They would consider that already have been a year. 
okay so i don't want it to be confusing but i want you guys just to to grasp what i'm getting at and so knowing what we're talking about or or thinking on what we're talking about with with the three year difference and what this revelation revealed because we had to be at the end of a seven year cycle you see we've known this for a while that when this ends it's got to be at the end of the first seven years because it's got to leave two sets of seven left which will be seals and trumpets so it's like saying the end of seven years right and then it would be the beginning of 14 years so this piece of scripture became very very important when we realized that the one year the two years the three years and that in the fourth year now everything is good to the lord what did that mean it meant when israel turned 73 that's why i brought up the difference between 1900 and yet it was the 20th century it's it, there's difference those are two ways of counting things right so in this case unlike this case okay unlike this case when you say count from 70 to 80 you don't start at 70 you would start at 71 in the case of the counting for the years of the trees when 20 uh, uh when 2021 the spring of 2021 in may comes along israel will have turned 73 you see, they just turned 73. So it was 70 into 71, 71 into 72, 72 into 73. Now three years have been fulfilled. You see how it can kind of be messed up? It seems a little bit confusing, but it's just, it's two perspectives of looking at something when you're counting. And why is 73 so important? And it's something strange. I haven't spoken on this in quite a while, but I found the info I wanted on it. I just typed in biblical meaning with number 73 in the first verse of Genesis, and it popped up. So it's the number 70, uh, 37 and 73 and how they're mirrors of each other. But the number 73 is a very special number mathematically. I believe it's the only number of its kind, and I don't know the mathematics of this stuff, but it's the only number of its kind um, in relation to, to equations and so forth. So it's a, it has a very special meaning, but it turns out in the first verse of Genesis, it's everywhere. From 37, 73, and the calculations of this equaling that, and then taking the total number, and you divide it by this, and it equals 73, and 3, 7, and 37. I mean, it's everywhere. All right? So there's something very, very interesting with the number 73 in relation to the beginning. In the first verse of Genesis, there's this mystery of the number 73 all throughout it. You guys can go watch this video and see it for yourselves. Wasn't well, that interesting? Because this year, in May, you know, I, I believe it's connected more to Shavuot, but we're only a difference of a few days here, right? Because this is their this is their anniversary. So this year, on this date, this is 72 to the last day. This is 73. And what is this going to be, brothers and sisters? The beginning of the 14 years, right? Between here and here, okay? The beginning of the 14 years. So the beginning of Genesis, the beginning of 14 years. Connected to 73. So it's not some small thing. It, there's there's some very, very interesting reasons as to why this year equaled 73. We can do it in, in our natural world. We can show it in scripture now. And we can now understand that that timing that the world and the church was telling us to Cyrus just wasn't possible. But what we can know now and what everybody is always interested in more than anything else is when, <laughs> right? Alan, is this really it? Have we really got it this year? Is this really the truth? I'm telling you with everything I know, with everything that's been revealed to me over the last three and a half years, yes, this is it. This is the year and 
everything is about to change this spring. Okay? Remember, everything about this ministry, like I was saying, was based on the 70th. The only thing was, is we thought the world 70. Then we said, wait a second, maybe they're, maybe it had to do with them uh, uh, having, uh, what was it, the government. And then, you see, there was something missing, but the Lord always provided for us. You see, the Lord always continued to provide for us details. And that's another issue that sometimes people have is they say, well, yeah, the Lord has provided details and the Lord provides details, but that could keep happening. It happened to everybody else in history. Yeah, but do you believe the Bible's true? Do you, do you believe that one day the end of days are actually going to take place, that they're going to be an actual thing? Wait, did you think maybe in, in some day, not in your lifetime? Look around, man. Look what's happened over the last year. You know, the, the revelation that I got from the Lord in August of 2019 was that, that one big one, the first one, I shouldn't say the first one, I'd had so many before that, but where it was just dropped into my spirit while I was in the shower, because I was, I was again frustrated with the Lord and saying, how could this be? You know, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Do you remember how this whole, how can it be, Lord, Zechariah chapter 7 and Zechariah chapter 1? You know, these 70 years, and in Zechariah chapter 7, those 70 years, right? When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, meaning for 70 years, including the 70th, you will fast and you will mourn in the fifth and seventh month. You see, we're, we're in the true 70th, but in 2019, you can understand why I, was, why I was so upset. How is this possible, Lord? But then I was dropped in my spirit. It's because, you see, if it wasn't going to be at that time, well, then guess what? If it was missed, then everything would be off. It would, it would go into like 2034, 2035. And I thought, Lord, this isn't making any sense. And the Lord dropped into my spirit right in that moment that it was the Lord returning after 13 years and that he would fulfill the 14th. So it just came into my mind after 13 and here for the 14th. It just, I didn't hear a voice or anything. I've never heard a voice. It just came to my thoughts. Obviously, Holy Spirit given. And soon as it did, within seconds, I, I thought of a half dozen places where I've been teaching the 14 years. Right in that moment, I thought of them. And every single place had 13 and the Lord returning and fulfilling the 14th. And I said, oh, my goodness. I started freaking out, man. I knew that was the from the Lord, just dropped it into my spirit so I would understand. So people would say, well, see, you, you can keep getting things like this and it'll keep going. No. You see, that's why I'm telling you the story. Because there's an end. The Lord will return feet down on the Mount of Olives after, after 2,000 years, right? After two days, after 2,000 years. And he's going to fulfill then a thousand year reign for the seven thousandth or the, the, till the end of the third day. It was 4,000 to his death and resurrection and 3,000 forward for a total of 7,000. You see, he's returning after 6,000 years or after 2,000 years from his death and resurrection. So what that drop into my spirit told me was that I was understanding. I didn't have the exact timing yet, but I had the understanding because here it is. It is 14, but he's coming after 13 and will fulfill that 14th. That was vital because when I got that, I realized that, okay, it could not go further. We weren't looking at a 2034 into 2035 time frame. It still equaled the same time. So when I'm telling you that, yes, we are here, it's because we're here. Everything has revealed it. All right? And I'm just going into this little side note of things because I know this is what people really want to hear. They really want to make sure of the understanding Go print this off. This is in the description box of all the videos. Israel is uh, as the timepiece. 
Okay, Israel is God's timepiece. There's your spring of 71, when they turn 71 in the spring of 2021. There's your 10 years, Psalms 90 and 10. Okay, right before day one of spring or May 50, May 14th of 2031. You know, if we're stick on the same calendar, okay? There's your 10 years. Then you got a short period of time called soon cut off. So you'd go from what? End of 80 is the beginning of 81. 81, about six months, goes from the spring of 31 to the fall of 31. This is when Messiah is going to be cut off. Satan is cast down. Those in Jerusalem, this isn't our flying away. This is mid-trumpets. Okay, This is Revelation 12, 14, when they fly away for three and a half years. So you got 10 years, six months, and three and a half years. That's 14 years. But I said the Lord returns after 13 years. See, after the 2,000 years are fulfilled. So there's your about six months. Messiah's been cut off. Then you have your half year, six months, year and a half, two and a half years. So at the end of 83, right before the 84th anniversary, what happens? See, from the fall of 31, continuing from over here, this is Satan's reign. Fall of 31 till the end of 33, which is just before spring of 34, to the end of 33 is two and a half years. This is Satan's reign. This is Satan's reign. And Messiah returns at the end of the sixth, uh, the sixth trumpet. And it'll be the end of those 2,000 years since his death and resurrection. And he fulfills that final year, which is like, you can see it in, in the, the seventh trumpet. You can go read when he comes feet down in Zechariah 14. It's Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Everybody thinks it's a week that, that means the seven years. It does not. It means a week as a year like every other thing in Daniel 9 is. It's weeks as years. Okay, Daniel 12, 7, the, the two and a half years of his reign, time, times, and a half a time. It's everywhere. All right? If this isn't true, and we go into uh, uh, fall, and we go into winter, and it's spring of 2022, and nothing has changed, guys, scrap this. Stop watching Ministry Revealed. The 14 years won't be true. You see how committed I am? I just told you. <laughs> it's true. It's coming. This is the time, brothers and sisters. All right? So I won't harp on that too much more. People might say, oh, where is the time? Where This is where I think the meteors are going to be seen. I believe the bride leaves in the morning here. And the 50 days or the 40 of the Son of Man will begin on the 29th. According to the Hebrew count calendar. And... Shavuot, Pentecost will end here. It'll be the Holy Ghost anointing upon those and the 14 years will begin, you know, between here and here, between, you know, that time frame, okay? And then the 14 years will begin. Now, what a lot of people also want to understand, like I said, we're going to go into this stuff with Ezra, but a lot of people, including myself, want to, have, want to see if we can get a better picture of where we are right now to to our escape time, you know, or or what's going to happen during the the fifty day portion of time? What is it? Can we show a little bit more of maybe understanding the attack that's coming against Israel? Are we going to see an attack on America before we go? Is it going to be an attack on America first, or is it going to be meteors that hit America? So what? How is this going to take place? So we'll we'll look a little bit more into this as well. And uh, and into that that portion of fifty days and understanding it from what I believe is is the time frame of our escape. For anybody that's new, you've you've heard me say the the fourteen years and the Lord's coming after thirteen, and you're thinking, man, this guy's crazy. Before you want to say crazy, you want to go come watch this introduction uh, playlist. All right, it's called the the revealed end times study note series. 
30 minutes to understand who the Gospels are speaking to in the end times, you'll find out that the reason Luke speaks different and Mark speaks different and Matthew speaks different on certain subjects is because they're literally speaking to different groups of people. Luke is speaking to the bride of Christ. Mark is speaking to the sleeping church that's going to go through seals. And Matthew, where the whole world has been taught from, is learning from Matthew. And Matthew is to the Jews who is going to endure trumpets. So you see, if the whole world of church is being taught from a foundation of Matthew, then the first thing you're going to see is the rapture of the whole church and the time of Jacob's trouble. That's because you're being taught from a Matthew perspective. That's the confusion. What we've missed in being taught from a Matthew foundation is you've missed Mark, the sleeping church that goes in the rapture before Matthew's time starts is Mark's group that went through the seals tribulation, the sleeping church. You see how important these are? These are 30 minutes each. You can understand the differences in those gospels. You'll understand that it's two sets of seven for the tribulation of seals and trumpets. That's that 13 to 14. Six years of seals, the seventh is rest. Six years of trumpets, the seventh is rest, or we, we should say Sabbath, okay? And the Lord is returning at the end of that second seven, or sorry, at the, at the end of the, the sixth trumpet, which is seven years of seals, six years of trumpets, bang, he returns. Feet down on the Mount of Olives. And that final year, he will fulfill it himself, bringing destruction against all those who came against Jerusalem. And to understand how all this was missed, you come to video number three, and it will it will explain to you how everything was missed. And the, the basis of the whole video is because the whole world of church has been taught from a foundation of the Jews, meaning the gospel of Matthew. You see, they didn't properly understand, and that's what this video will show you, the begin to show you, is... The reason for the different ways the Gospels are speaking about events, it has nothing to do with giving another perspective. It, it does, in a sense, for the events that happened in the past, but in the prophetic way, you'll understand that they're speaking to different groups for the future. All right? They all have printouts of the, the pages that I read. They're all in the description box below. All right? I always like to tell people about that one. That's always very important. And the other place, uh, you may have heard me mention in the forum, you can come here to our website and you can go into the forum. All of our videos are, are available uh, for free. All of our documents, everything is available on the forum, on the website for free. You can join the forum. There's about 600 people in there sharing, um, having chats, praying, all sorts of things. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. You can support the ministry here. And yeah, it's, guys... It's such an exciting time, and and I know you guys feel it as much as I do, man. I just, I have, I have so many videos that I'm excited and ready to do, and, and sometimes I just feel mentally bogged down because I, 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 I don't know, you know, as I even on praying about these things, you know, I, I just know that the spirit takes over, the spirit guides and leads me as I get going in the videos, and. Going in, though, to decide where I'm going to go in the next video and what I'm going to talk about, because I have so many, and I know we don't have a lot of time left, I just feel like, ah, man, Lord, what can I tell them that, that would just be so, wow, that would just so be such a telling piece of information that would that would be visible or something take place in the earth? that they would all start to scream loudly being awake. That would go reveal it to family and friends, and the family and friends would be able to see it and say, whoa, that's what I pray for every day. That, that wow factor to just get, to get the people to wake up, to, to get so many more to see and to understand. You know, it's, it's just, it, it's that blessing and it's that burden, right? It's that, it's that excitement and it's the heaviness, right? 
and it's awesome <laughs> and it's I don't want to say draining, but it, it can feel like that sometimes, right? Because there's just so much. <sighs> All right. So, like I said, I want to talk a little bit as well about this this early portion of things. This between now and the time the 14 years begins. And, you know, one of the things, I've mentioned this a number of times, the there's something that that still catches me and makes me say, huh. And it's when I read 1 Thessalonians 5. When you read 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, I just, I scratch my head and I say, but, uh, but it sounds like 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, it, it sounds like it's connected to the escape. But it sounds even more so like it's connected to the 50 days. Meaning at the end of the 50 days. That's that's the sense I get with reading it. And I'm going to show you a little bit about that today. In, in discerning this period of time at about our escape to, to the time when the 14 years start in mid-May. And again, this will all tie in to Cyrus and bring it, uh, bring us into Ezra. All right. So let's start here first. You could see this word for sorrows. You see it's up here. It's the word travail, pain, sorrows. See, as pain in childbirth. Okay. It's very, very interesting. Wait till you see this. We see that, of course, Mark and Matthew... Both say these are the beginnings of sorrows. Well, the beginnings of sorrows, what does this mean, beginnings of sorrows? Well, if we go look, let's show you this word right here. Let's go into where one of them is that I'm going to show you and break it down for you. The word shows up only four times, as you saw. And this one here in Acts 2.24, it says, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Here's the word, right? Pains of death. Only used four times, meaning especially of childbirth. So when we're reading, or when we're seeing here, that Mark and Matthew, that these are the beginnings of sorrows, what do we have to remember? There's more than one, right? There's more than one. What does that mean? What am, what am I getting at? Well, there's those who, who will go before the pains begin, correct? As Isaiah 66 says, we know that. That's the pre-trib. That was, that was the first revelation that came to me on uh, September 8th, 2017, in the midst of a video. I had just been repeating what everybody else was to that point. But something caught my attention reading Revelation 12. And as I was reading it, I was saying, wait a second. Revelation 12, 5 is after the pain she delivered. Isaiah 66 says before she travailed, before her pain, she was delivered. So then you got to say, well, wait a second. And that was what started it all with me. That was the very beginning when the Spirit put that question in and everything since then has exploded. Well, this is the same thing going on here. in. In Mark and in Matthew, if you go look at Revelation chapter 12, we see that in Mark and in Matthew, see, she cried, travailing in pain to be delivered. And then down here in five, she brings forth. And then there's the caught up. This was caught up, as many of you know, isn't for the pre-trib. This is the mid-trib or after seals. This is the rapture of the great multitude. But it is not the pre-trib. The pre-trib must come before she begins to travail. You see that? And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. So before her crying and travailing, before uh, it starts... The, bride, the, the, the pre-trib has to have already happened. And what's interesting here is verse 1. 
you can probably go back into my videos. Oh man, I would say even a little more than three years ago. You know, it's been about three and a half years, probably over three and a half, uh, over three years now. You can go back and see videos where I say between here, the end of verse one to the beginning of verse two is the pre-trib escape of the bride. And why I'm bringing it up now is because this woman seen clothed with the sun and everything else, I believe, and I've said it in the past, that she's the one that's bringing tribulation, right? She brings the judgment. So if this is the judgment, which is the travailing and pain to be birthed, this could be when she's first seen coming. And I believe that her being first seen coming before any travailing begins that means between the end of verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2 could be the escape time. And the bride may have still seen her coming. All right? I believe there's there's a possible connection. I've got a video about it as well. Right? Uh, uh, what did I call it? Uh, the woman clothed with the sun or something like that. And she's the one that may bring that stone. Okay, this is how the, the first stone that the Lord would cast that I believe the bride will see that we might see by uh, March 23rd. Is that what it was? Let's just make sure. Okay, March 20, 26, sorry. I believe this is the day that we'll see it. I don't know if it hits. I don't know if we just see it. I believe it's something connected to this date on March 26th. Now, um, you see, so this this crying and in, tra in travail, and what does that mean in relation to Mark and to Matthew? Well, it says, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be uh, earthquakes in diverse places, famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Well, what's nation against nation? You see, Matthew says something similar, but it's not the same. And we'll get to that in a, little, in a little while. You see, when you go to the seals, at the red horse, what is it? And there went out a horse that was red and power was given unto him to take peace from the earth. That sounds to me like at the end of 50 days when the Holy Spirit leaves. Okay. To take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Okay. Like Ezekiel 21, the Lord's giving warning during the 40 days to say, hey, the great sword, the sword is going to be furbished. The Lord God is giving the sword to the slayer, it says. Okay, this is it, that they should kill one another. Well, what is the red horse rider? What is the red horse rider in relation to the beginning of, of tribulation and in relation to the the um, discourses. It's right here. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is the red horse rider. And then it says, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines. So I just showed you the red horse rider is nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's World War III breaking up. See how it's interesting that it's the first one there? It's the first one in the discourse. It's, it's, it's talking about it before the earthquakes. It's talking about it before the famines. Okay? And it turns out it's the first one in the judgments after the white horse rider, which is related to the attack on Israel that will come before the 14 years breaks out at the red horse rider. And after the red horse rider, there's a black horse rider. And the black horse rider is what? Famine. It's going to be famine from the word, and it's going to be literal famine. What did Mark say? Mark said that it would be nation against nation, and it would be famine. Okay? We know that troubles in Mark means roiling water. I think because part of the things is when the stone is cast down. All right? When that stone is cast, I believe it's going to hit the water. It's going to be the roiling of water. That's why it's only in Mark's discourse. <coughs> But when we get to the pale horse rider, now things start to change, right? Um, it was death and hell followed him. 
and he had power that was given unto him over a fourth part to kill uh, of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. You see, all of this is still connected. To what? The beginning. Okay? Even right up to this time of the pale horse. I'd say even right around the time of the pale horse is then you could move on from the beginning of sorrows. Okay? What you have in difference between Matthew and Mark's discourses is Mark has troubles and Matthew's instead of troubles, it says uh, earthquakes and nation against nation, famines and pestilence. Okay? Pestilence is always the stuff that you find when we're talking about Judah. Okay? You'll see that as we go into some of the scriptures as well. So these are all the beginnings of sorrows. These go from when the tribulation begins into, you know, about midway through. You're going to say, well, why does it only count for midway through? Why isn't it? Why doesn't it go to the end of seals? Well, first of all, because it's only the beginning of sorrows. What's going to happen at about the midway point? Well, if you follow the rest of Mark's gospel, after this beginnings of sorrows, look at what comes next. Take heed, they're going to deliver you up into councils. You know, some of you are going to be killed, but don't, you know, let the Holy Ghost speak for you. You know, all the, what's happening? You're about to be hated. All the Christians are about to be hated. All those during the greatest revival in the history of earth are going to start now going through incredible persecution. Is it going to start right away? Yeah, sure, it's going to start right away, but not to the extent as it will after about the mid portion of seals. Okay, after the time of about the middish portion that I say is when the foundation will have been laid. You're going to see something pretty cool when we get into Ezra. Okay, in relation to this mid seals time frame. Okay, so all of this is the beginnings of sorrows. It's here. Let me show it to you in the, in the graph. See the lion, the bear, the leopard, and then the Antichrist starts to show up. All of this prior, previous stuff here, the, like about the first half of seals, is world war. Is absolute devastation and war and starvation and pestilence and earthquakes. I mean, it's going to be horrible. That's only the beginning. Isn't that terrible? Isn't that horrific? It's only the beginning. But you see at about this midway point, say, you know, three and a half years or so. So you could say, you can look at it and say, well, third year or fourth year. Remember what we were saying earlier? In the third, fourth year, however you want to say it. What's interesting with that is, like I said, when we go into Ezra, you're going to see when we get into Ezra chapter four, this connection in Daniel and the word that's being used. And you're going to say, well, what does that have to do with now? Or what does that have to do with the connection to this beginnings of sorrows, which goes right into about mid seals? Because the cutoff point of beginning of sorrows is the exact same everywhere. What happens next? They start going after Christians. Why are they going after Christians? The abomination of desolation. Antichrist shows up. Antichrist shows up. He's getting his power to continue 42 months. The mark of the beast will become official. <clears throat> his, his statue bowing down, whatever, all of those things and worshiping the beast. That's why when you get then to mid-seals, you then see at the pale horse rider, there's still more of this from the from the, the beginnings of sorrows. And when you get into the fifth seal, it says you see the souls of them that were beheaded, right? Those that were killed for having the testimony of the Lord. So that means it started, give or take it around, somewhere about the pale horse rider. And that's why you have them at the fifth seal under the altar. Because they refuse to take the mark. 
we see these people, of course, in, uh, I think it's Revelation 20. Those that were beheaded for their faith did not take the mark of the beast and so forth. Well, same thing if you go to Revelation chapter 12. You go to Revelation chapter 12. Remember, I said this is the beginning of tribulation. Okay? Between here and here, the end of the first verse and the beginning of the second verse is the escape of the bride. You even have some of this. In fact, this is pretty cool. This first portion, <laughs> my voice is getting scratchy. This first portion of verse two, and she being with child cried. We shared this, uh, our sister uh, uh, Jamie caught this and shared this with us. This word cried means as a raven. You want to know why that's cool? Because it's connected to another part we talked about and that we're going to be talking about here, which is connected to Genesis chapter 8. Remember, we're talking about this 50-day time frame before the 14 years begins. So when the 40 days of the Son of Man are done, remember I said from, from the, what is it, the 29th, the Pentecost, and, and the, the beginning of the count for 40 days within it, they're the 40 days of the Son of Man. That he said that in Luke 17 would be as it was in the days of Noah. Okay, so shall the days of the Son of Man be. Well, at the end of the 40 days, Noah opens the window to the ark and what goes out? The raven. The raven goes out and it just so happens in Revelation chapter 12, the and she cried means as a raven. Well, do you see how at the end of 40 days, it's still not the beginning of travailing yet? Do you get that? You see, the travailing doesn't begin at the raven. The travailing, as you see in Revelation 12, doesn't begin at the crying. See, this would be what? To the 40 days. But when you get to the 50 days, 50 days are over and the Holy Ghost has come for a few hours or however that plays out, the Holy Ghost comes and boom, the Holy Ghost is gone. The travailing in birth then begins. See how wild that is? This is why I believe this first verse is connected to the meteors and the stone coming down, that the bride would see it. We know in Luke 22, I believe it was, the stones throw away. In John chapter 8, like we shared in the last video, who, who here has no sin, let him cast the first stone. We know Jesus is the only one that has no sin that can cast that first stone. All right. I believe that the bride will see it. I don't know if we're going to, if it's going to hit, we're still going to be here, but I believe we'll see it coming. That's what Luke 21 is about. All right. It may hit, but I, I would say probably not. Okay. But when we see it, men's hearts failing them for looking up. Right? For, uh, for fear and looking after those things that are coming upon the earth. Well, that's where this is. She's up in the sky too. So then the 40 days, the bride is gone. The 40 days of the Lord, the 40 days are over. The raven cries or the raven's there. And then at the end of 50, when the dove is gone out and then goes back into heaven, the travailing in birth begins. Well, guess what? That's exactly as we shared over here. In the last few videos, I love this one too, because just like the one Jamie found, this one is amazing as well. Because when you look at the word stayed and stayed, well, you would think it means like this, right? To, to tarry, to wait, right? To hang out for a little bit. But in Genesis 8.10, as many of you guys know that I shared recently, the dove, so the, the raven goes out after 40. Then the dove goes out. That would be 10 days later. That's on the 50th day of Pentecost. There's that Acts 2.0 anointing that goes out. And when the dove goes, can't find any place for her feet, the dove leaves back into the ark. That's what? At the end of the 50th day. So at the end of 50 days, the dove leaves. And we have seven and seven. Seven days is years. Seven days is years. But at the end of the 50 as the first seven are about to start, you have the word stayed. That means to travail in pain. 
pain, sorrow, travail. It's incredible that the word means this, right? I mean, it is such a clue. It's one of those little Holy Spirit drops, right? Never even bothered to look at the definition of the word until just a, about a month ago, whatever it was. It's mind-blowing. And it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Because just as we were showing here <coughs> in chapter 12, there's the raven as cried, and then there's the travailing in pain. So what is this travailing in pain all about? This one portion of verse 2 is what you just saw in Mark and Matthew that said, the beginnings of sorrows. This here in verse 2 alone is the red horse rider, the black horse rider, and probably a portion of the pale horse rider. The beginning of tribulation or the beginning of sorrows. The first half of seals is all in this strip of words right here. How do we know that? Verse three, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a great red dragon. Well, here it is. Now the Antichrist is about to show up. And then we see, then later on, he drew a third part of the stars. So there's things happening in the heavens. There's things happening on the earth, right? And what happens? Well, this is when he's seen. So now the Antichrist is going to be seen. The Antichrist is coming on the scene. Isn't that exactly what we just showed here? That's exactly what comes after the beginnings of sorrows. Antichrist comes on the scene. And now it's going to be a very difficult time for Christians. Craziest time on earth for Christians. And there it is, right at about mid-seals. Remember, you're going to see something really cool when we go into this and we get into it with Ezra. Okay? If in Ezra containing in chapter 4. <laughs> it's pretty wild, all right? So how about looking at this with Acts chapter 2, as I was showing earlier? Well, in Acts chapter 2, this beginning of sorrows or this type of pain, here it is, verse 24, listen to the connection to this pain. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Now, this is a different pains, or sorry, it's the same pains, but this pains connected also to childbirth like the other ones is telling us that at the time God raised him up, well, when did God raise him up? <laughs> exactly the same time we're looking for, isn't it? Resurrection day. So at the time that God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death. Do you get it? Those who will be alive at the time of the escape, those who are in Christ at the time of the escape, remember they're not going to taste of death. Do you remember in Luke chapter 9? Right? It's, it's one of our, our old time favorites that I haven't said in a little while. See? Uh, it starts in 26, but in Luke 9, 27, but I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And then you see the Lord talking about, and it came to pass about an eight days. We know the type and shadow of that means about an eight years. And you say, but I thought it was seven and the bride goes, yeah, almost the eighth, because it's the portion a little bit above eight, that 50 or so day portion, a little bit above eight. That's why when the Lord comes, it was almost or about round the eighth day. Which is the beginning of the next set of seven, which is, of course, seals and trumpets. It's awesome, isn't it? So there's the group that won't taste death till they see the kingdom of God. So we're going to be taken alive and see the kingdom of God. Well, in Acts chapter 2, when is Acts chapter 2 talking about? When God raised them up. When did God raise them up? 
in Luke chapter 24, verse, you know, verse one, two, and so forth, right? And what happened in Luke 24 that we love to talk about? Only in Luke do we see that that is when the body of Christ was gone. See, his bride. That's the reason it's there. That's the reason it's worded like that. But it's not in Mark and it's not in Matthew. We've covered it many times. So when he was raised at that time, when God raised him up at that time, he loosed, meaning he broke the childbirth pain of death. So he broke the chain of death. Okay, the pains of death as what? Well, to not experience death. So in the in the pre-trib birthing, which is before she travails, see, before the childbirth, before the pain begins, at the time when he was raised up and loosed it so that we wouldn't experience the childbirthing, that pain, but in relation to death. Why? Or when? Resurrection day. The exact same day. And how can we prove this out? Well, like I was showing you, <clears throat> when we looked at this in Exodus, uh, sorry, in Genesis, and we saw this word stayed, it's the travailing in pain. Well, this travailing in pain begins after the 50 days, meaning, boom, day one after the 50th, the tribulation has begun. When you go to uh, Isaiah 66, this is where you get the confirmation of it. This is how you can prove it's all pre-trib. Before she travailed. See, this was the word we just found for that word, uh, uh, shall yet or whatever it is. I think uh, 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 stay seven more days or whatever it is. This was the one after the 50 days. It's the same word here as travailed. We shared this again recently. Okay? But look at what this says. Before. So before this pain begins, before this whirling and travailing with the pain begins, a group was already gone. So for those wanting to, to get excited about things, it means... Before the end of the 50 days, before that travailing began, the pre-trib had happened. And we've shown in the last few videos, we've talked about that with the 50 and the fact that uh, the 40 and the 10 showing that it's the pre-trib. So that's why you, you haven't heard me say, oh, well, maybe this day. And, you know, we're watching for this day along the way. Do I hope it's earlier? Yeah, of course, I hope it's earlier. Do I think it's earlier? No. I believe with all my heart that we're looking at the Passover time frame, the resurrection day. And again, I'm sticking with the Hebrew calendar. So let's see what else. Oh, how about this, right? Here's another one for you guys. Um. Maybe more so even for new people. You see that he showed himself unto Caiaphas and the 12, then above 500 at once, the greater part who are still alive to this day. Then he showed himself to James and all the apostles. Then Paul says, also to me as one born out of due time. What does that mean? Before she travailed. You see, you're reading it like this, but the understanding is in reverse. The end of days, it's pre-trib, one born out of due time. That means before she travailed in pain, she delivered. And then what? Then he's going to show himself to all the apostles. That's what he's going to do during the 50 days or his 40 days. So you got pre-trib or Luke chapter one. You've got 40 days of the Lord and showing himself to all his apostles and his disciples. Those are going to receive the Holy Ghost anointing. That's Luke chapter 2. Then you have being seen by above 500 and the greater part remain unto this day. This is the rapture and the great multitude that'll be there. Many of them were killed and the majority are in a great multitude still there to that day. And then this is post 
when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Or Luke chapter 4, <clears throat> when the tribes, the 12 tribes and the heads of the 12 tribes will be chosen and will lead during the millennial reign. Okay? Always pre, guys. Pre. That's why we can be excited. That's why it's hard to sleep. <laughs> we know it's coming. We, we're waiting for that event, right? We're waiting for that one thing. Are, are we going to see this, this Israel attack? Is it going to be part of something we're going to see? Because here's another piece with all of this. In this, in this Israel attack, you know, I've been saying for a long time that I believe we're going to see this attack happen first. In fact, I, I still am sure that we're going to see it first. I don't know how much sooner first we're going to see it. I don't know if it's days before. I, I, I don't know if it's if it, if maybe we don't see it and, and it, it, it's part of the 50 days. It, it, it's very interesting. And here's why I say that. Because the Son of Man will be here. And it will begin in Jerusalem. See? So, I know that in the first attack, there will be these attacks. And it means maybe that Jerusalem isn't fully hit. Maybe part of it is, right? Maybe a portion here, there. Or maybe it's it's more so the other parts of Israel. And maybe that certain parts of Jerusalem are, are still, for the most part, standing. And the, the people will remain, as we know. They're going to remain, and they're going to think, hey, everything's great. Uh, you know, we're going to be able to settle things down now. But when they finally make that decree to settle things down, bang! The rest of the attack happens, and then, of course, it's World War III from that point on, okay? So now as we look into this, <clears throat> we've talked about uh, Second Chronicles 36 a number of times, but I wanted to see if I could find more details about this, and there's quite a few things. Remember what I said earlier, um, we'll, we'll notice these things with the time frame of the Antichrist, the time frame of, of the foundation being laid as we go further into seals. And one thing I wanted to, to, to see if I can get more understanding of was before we get into um, the time of Persia or the time of Cyrus, okay? Because when Cyrus comes to power, as we read, Right off the bat in, in Ezra chapter 1, we see that he's the one that makes this proclamation. Okay? Now, when we read about this proclamation, we understand that it begins the 14 years. So it's quite interesting. Because when he does, we know it doesn't happen for seven years where they can actually start fully rebuilding everything. But there's details in his story that will give us more understanding as we go into the tribulation. But what about even, again, you know, we were talking about this 50 days and, and this portion between now and then. You know, what, what are these pieces we can glean from this first attack on Israel? You see, because this is another thing. Yeah, everybody wants to know the time or the time frame. And they say, okay, great. You know, but to how many people they'd say, oh, yeah, I've heard Alan talk about the a date that he believes it is before or or a time frame that he believes it is before. That's up to you guys and God now, whether you want to believe it or not. OK, but what if something like a major event we discussed happened before the bride leaves? What if we see Israel get attacked and the Middle East war break out? What if we see that happen? Now will you guys believe? If you see Israel get attacked or a Middle East war break out and Israel is, is very attacked as well in parts of Jerusalem and tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands or more dead in the Middle East, now will you listen? Now will you take notice? 
And if you do, what will you do with that? Will you still just hang out and say, oh, now oh, it's so exciting. We just got to wait. First of all, we've got to pray, right? That's a lot of people dying over there. But it's nothing compared to what's coming. But after you've done some praying and, and seeking the Lord on those things, now you need to let people know like crazy, don't you? And if they say, oh, yeah, well, you're just telling me now after the fact. You know what? Show them some of these videos where we've been talking about this for a long time. Get people to come and see the understanding of what it really means. What this timing means. Because that's what it's all about. It's, we're trying to wake people up. I'm trying to, to give you guys strength and, and power to keep going forward in understanding of the scriptures and, and in understanding of the times that we're in and to draw closer to him and understanding him in these days and in these days to come. There's a greater part to this ministry that I haven't fully understood yet because it's all about the end of days. But this is, this is to be used to, to grab more people's attention. And I know it's been hard lately. It's been very hard to catch people's attention. You know, we said March 11th last year. March 11th, the global pandemic was declared. And then we, on the same day it was that it was declared was the day, of course, we thought it was the escape. But it was a global change that happened, wasn't it? Right on the day we said. And I had the email that night. The night before the declaration. Right about the 50 being right on target. And with that email was a video that was sent that she had never seen, never hear, heard from the guy before, nothing. And the video was that in the end, like what they were trying to do, and it was from 2010, right? What they were trying to do is an, a war with Israel and Iran, and then they were going to release a flu-like virus where China would catch a cold. It would spread to the West. The West would go into lockdown. You would see for sure that it's real because there's still deaths going on around the world from it. And it would mutate and it would be called a pandemic. I mean, that's what the guy said from a video in 2010. And we're living it. They just had the order wrong. It'll be God's timing. So if the pandemic has happened and the release has happened, as they said, what's next? The Israel attack. And then what did they say was next? World War Three. You see? We're in the midst of one of them right now. I was listening, um, before I get more into this, uh, a, a brother had shared with me uh, a, a clip or the video from um, from Perry Stone. He was on one of the shows and he was talking about how he saw this parallel. And I thought, man, it was really interesting. Now, he was talking about the parallel as in the days of Noah. Now, again, please, everybody understand. We know here in this ministry that the story of Noah and the ark is is twofold. OK, there's a story within it that we talk about regularly, which is the 40 days, the raven, dove, and then it's the two sets of seven. It's literally giving us a really big picture, uh, uh, sorry, a really overview picture, really high up overview picture of the end of days. And to, to tell us from Luke 17 why Jesus was telling us that his days in Luke 17 would be as, as Noah's. Okay, those 40 days as the Son of Man. But we also know that the story of the ark in Noah's story in relation to Matthew in his gospel during the discourse is a literal type and shadow story uh, as a whole in the final year when Jesus comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. Okay, those that will be in the ark, those that will be taken to be protected, and those who will be left and will be decimated. All right, that came against Israel in Jerusalem. So, and we know that that's going to be a type of one year event, and that's what the relation of it is in Matthew to the relation of the original story playing out just over a year. Now, what Perry Stone was getting at that I found was very interesting is in looking at it in another way, 
is saying, look, the, 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 it was about a year. It was a little bit over a year, about a year, right? In the story of the Ark. <clears throat> well, Perry Stone said, you know, he found it was interesting because if you take the story of the Ark and it was about a year, he says, what had happened? He says, if you look around the world right now, the whole world has been in a lockdown, right? Now, yeah, there's some going out, but essentially, for the first time in human history, it's been a lockdown. In fact, I was I heard on our news tonight that in the city where I live in Calgary, a fairly big city, about a million and a half, <laughs> compared if you're living in China or certain other parts of the world, but you know, a million and a half people, and they said uh, so far in, in 11 months, I think it was January to November of 2020, there were 13,000 fewer car accidents. <laughs> 13,000 fewer car accidents. It sounds like a crazy number, but I guess it's fairly par for the course. And um, it was because so many people are staying at home. All right. My wife's been working from home since, man, for a long time now. They said, oh, don't even bother in January. It won't be till uh, March at least. And so she works for an oil and gas company. And they're all just working remotely now. So there's all of this lockdown. There's no doubt for the first time in human history, there's a complete lockdown of the world. But what he said is he compared it to the days of Noah. Meaning in Noah's time, the whole of the world that was left alive was Noah and his family. And they were in the ark for about one year. All right. So you had a time in, in history where the whole world, eight people were in lockdown in their home in, in the ark. And for the first time in human history, the whole world is experiencing that same type and shadow. Well, the reason I'm bringing it up and why I think it's it's interesting is because it was about one year. Okay? Last year was March 11th. So a year, some people will say it was 364. Some will say it's 371 that it equals. Okay? But it's about one year, and here we are coming up to it. And it just so happens as we're coming up to it, which would be the anniversary here, we're literally in the time frame of everything we're talking about happening. That's pretty wild, right? There's another type and shadow built into that. And I wanted to share that. It's just, it, it's pretty cool, guys. There's, you know, <laughs> for those that doubt, all they got to do is look around, right? Just look around, guys, okay? Look around, have patience, take heart, be ready. Watching and praying always because the time is at hand. Now, we've talked about this here with Nebuchadnezzar. And as I was looking into this and trying to get more detail for this, because like I said, when we go to, to Ezra and you see chapter one and we see that it's about Cyrus coming to power and he makes the declaration. Well, we've understood that from Second Chronicles 36. We see that uh, Zedekiah, who's a type and shadow, I believe, of Netanyahu. Okay. In his 11 years. And Netanyahu's 11 years are up on March 30th, 2021. Okay, isn't that interesting? Zedekiah, his name used to be Metanyahu or Netanyahu, right? Like now, in his 11th year. And his 11th year will be up March 30th. And they're calling for elections on uh, March 23rd, I think it is. <laughs> All of these things right in this time. And you see that Nebuchadnezzar... You know, Zedekiah just wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen to the prophets. He rebels against King Nebuchadnezzar, and he's stiff-necked, and God says, you know what? I can't do anymore. I've sent messengers. I've done everything. So what happens, as we've talked about this before, Nebuchadnezzar allows the Chaldeans to come and attack. They come in. They attack. They slay them. They burn the place with fire. And we read... Um, in verse 20, and them that had escaped of the sword, uh, carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign <coughs> excuse me, of the kingdom of Persia. 
And we see to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. We've talked about that so often. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept her Sabbaths to fulfill three score and ten years, to fulfill the 70 years. Okay? We know that for seven years, They've missed seven Sabbaths of allowing the land to rest. And it's all going to take place. It's going to begin and fulfill the 70th year of Israel. And you see, this 70th, this is why it's so important to understand. Because in Bible prophecy, everything (laughs) relates to the 70th. So I, I understand why people said, Oh, yeah, this guy's been saying it last year, and he said it the year before and the year before, because everything was connected to the 70th. Every every end time or, or Bible prophecy pastor on earth and teacher, they were all talking about it back when it was the 70th. But you didn't hear a peep out of them when the 70th was over. I don't blame them. You needed that piece of scripture, right? You needed that piece of scripture from Leviticus 19. You needed to have the revelation of the Sabbath years, the Shemitah years. You needed, with that revelation, you needed to understand why there was a gap of years in between. So when it says 70, it seems confusing. Why didn't it say 73, Lord? Right? Because he says, you should have known from my word. I had it right there. You see? That's the difference, guys. And so these 70 years, or to fulfill three score and 10, which is the 70 years, it, it, it's, the, it's, it's critical that we had that piece of scripture to understand it. And then it says, now in the first year of the king of Persia, he's going to make that declaration or that proclamation. We've shared before what that means, and we'll share it again in a bit. Well, as you look in to try to get more detail on this, we go to Jeremiah 34, and we see here, when the the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and against the cities of Judah that were left against Lashish and Azekah, For these defensed cities remained of the cities of Judah. Like, well, wait a second. What do you mean that were left? Well, because there must have already been an attack, you see? So, but it's saying, when the king of Babylon's armies fought against Jerusalem, it says, this is the word that came unto Jeremiah after that King Zedekiah, Netanyahu, made a covenant with all the people that were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty unto them. Okay, I'm going to show you this in a minute. But you see that we're left. So this army is coming against them as this, uh, sorry, as he's given the proclamation, the army's coming against them. And he's telling them why the army is coming against them again. Because don't forget, when we see here, it's like the this final devastation of it. But as we're looking at it here, it's like they've come again. You're going to see as you go through this scripture, it literally says, I've sent them again. So what does it mean by the cities that were left? See, for the cities, and when you see the names of the cities, you can get an understanding as to what it's talking about. Watch this. In Zechariah chapter 7, we haven't spoken about this in a long time. And it's one of my favorites. Uh, you guys know this. Those of you that have been watching this ministry for a while, you guys know this like the back of your hands. I used to talk about this all the time. But when things happen and you didn't know, you say, well, you can't really talk about it because you're trying to understand what about the 70 years, Lord? But now, for the last several months now, we've got this 70 years, don't we? Because here's the key piece. In Zechariah 7, verse 5 and 7, Why is it so key? Because as we know, it's 14 chapters equaling 14 years. This is to Judah. Hosea has 14 chapters to 14 years, and they are to the sleeping church or Israel, the Gentiles. Okay? This is Judah. 
Listen to what it says. When you fasted and mourned, past tense, in the fifth and seventh month, even those, past tense, 70 years, did you all fast unto me. So it's saying, for 70 years, including the 70th year, you fasted and you mourned in the fifth and seventh month. So what does that mean if we look, for example, on the Hebrew calendar? Where's the fifth month? The fifth month is the fifth month of Av. Okay? This is the fasting of the fifth month that we're, that they're talking about. So that means by July of 2021, they must already have been out of the land. They, Jerusalem will not 100% be left in the land by July 18th of 2021. Well before that, they're going to be removed from the land. Okay? And that's the clue of what it's telling you in Zechariah chapter 7. Because where are we now? We've proven we're in the 70th year. We're coming to the tail end of it. So the 5th and 7th month have passed because they are the 70th year. And listen to what it says. Now remember, we're relating to those, those two cities that were like strongholds. And it says... Um, by the former prophets, when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, so Jerusalem is inhabited, they are in prosperity, but everything here is saying past tense, was, when, when, inhabited, right? When you were in prosperity and the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south of the plain. Okay, what is that? What am I talking about? Why am I sharing the the south of the plain? Because these cities, Lachish and Azica, <clears throat> here they are. There's Jerusalem, south of the plain, south of Jerusalem. There's Lachish and Azica. The other one is somewhere. Oops, is somewhere in and around in here. Okay, they're south of Jerusalem. They're the strongholds, if you will. That's interesting, isn't it? So he's telling us, oops, let me go back. So he's telling us that this time Babylon came back again and finished off those defense cities, meaning the first attack didn't destroy them and completely remove them from the land. We've been talking about that for a long time, right? The first attack did not remove them from the land but was like a, was like a beat down warning just like we've said with this video here this is the one i said that i got with uh, uh the email last year on march 11th this guy talks about it in 2010 and his source first hand account of being in the room when it was discussed and it's israel and iran and they're not going to be completely removed it's going to be devastation but it's not going to be completely removed out of the land but what do we know? And what did he say later? Then World War III would follow next. World War III isn't going to begin at the first attack on Israel. The first attack on Israel will settle in Middle East, will settle quite quickly. And that will be that what will bring about the, the Ezra chapter 1. Okay? Because when this first attack happens, before the second one, listen, listen to what it says. So then Zedekiah, or Netanyahu, makes a covenant. And in his covenant, he says, everybody, it's freedom. Everybody should be uh, at liberty. He proclaims liberty over his city. But what happens is as he proclaims liberty, it was like the Lord had allowed this, this liberty to take place. He was in agreement with it. But then it says afterward, they turned. He changed his mind. And so they all, all the servants, nobody's been freed from the land. They're still there, you know, which shouldn't happen. They're supposed to be released. Remember the Shemitah cycles? Well, we read here in Jeremiah 34, verse 14, at the end of seven years, let go every man his brother, a Hebrew, which had been sold unto thee and so forth. He says, now you turned. 
from proclaiming everybody his liberty. You've turned and polluted my name in this. So the Lord says, therefore, thus saith the Lord, ye have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty, liberty, every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim liberty to you, says the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence and to the famine. The Lord says, fine, you're not going to bring them to liberty like you said you would. Because what happens, guys? Do you see the storyline there? What happens at the end of seven years? Ta-da! Set at liberty, right? At the end of seven years, set at liberty. That's what he's telling them. <coughs> and they didn't do it. And so what happens? The Lord is now going to come against them. And it's the same story every time. You can go into Jeremiah 34. You can go into Zechariah, uh, sorry, Jeremiah 21, Ezekiel 21, Isaiah 21. That was shared to me by our sister Faye. 21, 21, 21. And it's either a destruction coming against Babylon or the other two that are destructions coming against Jerusalem. It's everywhere. But you see, how can we prove this portion is against Jerusalem, okay, against Judah? There's always pestilence. The sword, see, the sword and to the pestilence and to famine. If you go into Matthew chapter 24, remember when we looked the beginnings of sorrows uh, for Mark? It was nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines earthquakes in diverse places, but in Marx it said troubles. That's the roiling of water. That's when I believe the meteor hits, the, 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 when the big one hits, I believe it's going to have the greatest destruction in the Western world in America than any other nation, but it will affect obviously all the nations. And this is part of what brings, get it? What brings what? What brings Babylon down? Okay, that brings America down. Then when this second war, when World War III breaks out, it's much easier to take over America and completely shut America down. The power of America needs to be diminished and wiped out, to, in a sense, for the world power, the world military, the one world government, all of that to take place. America has to be decimated as well not just Israel and Jerusalem. And that's why God will bring judgment first to his house and to Jesus's house, right? And you say, well, what do you mean Jesus's house? Well, God's house is Judah, right? Jesus is as Israel, the lost sheep, the lost tribes. You know what's really interesting about that? I was going to share this a couple of videos back. I talk about this uh, a fair bit. <clears throat> and I do have a video still coming on this. But you guys will remember when we talk about these seven churches, this is just a little side note. As we talk about these seven churches in relation to the 14 years or the end of days, do you notice that Pergamum, I know uh, those that are among you, I know the seat of Satan and everything else is connected, is connected to Constantine, okay? Which is connected to what? Rome. The time of Rome. So is it because Rome was the, was the good church and, and the Catholic church is where it's at? Now, is there, are there good people in the Catholic church? Are there true believers within the Catholic church? Yes, absolutely. But if you want to see the difference in the truth between the Catholic and the Reformation that took place, here it is. Church history proves. The 2,000 years almost of church history proves the difference between the Catholic Church, and the Reformation. The Reformation, guys, is when Christ returns as king over Israel in the first half of trumpets, at the end of seals when he shows up, and the first half of trumpets. It's the Reformation church time, just like the history of churches. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? But you see, it's the church, it's the Constantine uh, Catholic Church that's the... Uh, 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 um, where was I with uh, the Matthew portion? It's 
it's that portion in relation to, oh, there it was. Sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a second. It's that portion in relation to uh, um, the the timing in seals. Okay, when when this beginnings of sorrows in relation to Mark's eye when it comes to an end. See, it's going to relate to that Antichrist time coming to power. Interesting, right? When you see the 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 image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen, right? America, the the head already has to be destroyed. But you see this pestilence portion as we're talking about um, about Matthew, about Judas portion. It brings us back to what we know in Leviticus 26 for those years that they failed in their obedience. Now seven years they're going to be removed from the land. Plague is going to come upon them in what? Pestilence. See, it's against Matthew. The The sword is coming against them. You're going to be desolate. Your city's laid waste. Because you never allowed the land, it's seven years of rest. Now I got to remove you from it. You see? And pestilence is also connected to Matthew's portion yet again. Okay? That is their beginning. So this is something that's going to start really, really early on in relation to, to Matthew's portion of time or Judah's portion of time. So. We can see here to pray claim liberty. You guys didn't do that. As we read down towards the end of it, listen to this. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his princes will be given into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life and into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which are gone up from you. Here it is. Remember I said they'll come again. Behold, I will command, saith the Lord, and cause them to return to the city. And they shall fight against it and take it and burn it with fire. And I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without an inhabitant. You see, after the first attack, they're still there. They're still there. So this is why I believe that we will most likely see that first attack. But it's got to be an attack in a way that Jerusalem isn't so totally wiped out in the first attack. But when the declaration from the from the, the peace and safety, if you will, when the declaration of Cyrus comes, you see, it's going to be right towards the end of the 50 days, that time of, of that second attack. That's when this this time frame of this declaration will take place. This is what I was telling you guys about right here with 1 Thessalonians 5. You see, we we showed these two. We showed this one that's relating to the time of the escape, and it's the pains of death for for the escape of the bride. But 1 Thessalonians 5, as we read 1 Thessalonians 5, it sounds much more at the, to the time at the end of the 50 days. Okay? Listen to what it says. For when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child. Um, Coming upon them as a woman in travail with child, well, we know that the travailing doesn't start until the end of the 50th day. Even as Genesis 8, that word, even as Isaiah 66, there's the before she travailed escape, but then she travails. And that'll begin after the 50 days. You see, so there's a little something more, I'm not going to say sneaky, but a little bit more mysterious going on with 1 Thessalonians 5.3. And when we connect this declaration of peace and safety as travail upon a woman with child, that means when this declaration is made, it's got to be the time frame that the travailing begins. And if every piece of scripture that we're pointing to 
says that the travailing part begins after the 50th day. Well, then how is 1 Thessalonians 5.3 connected to the escape? Because the escape is prior to. Okay? We'll spend a little bit more time on that in another video. I don't want to go too, too far down that rabbit trail. Okay? So here we are now, as we saw that they're now going to be brought again. They're going to be destroyed. It was those that were in the south of the plain. We can see that it said that they were destroyed when it was what? Those 70 years. So when we go back into chapter one of Zechariah, which again, something we haven't gone into for quite a while, right? It was awesome because we've been going in so many other awesome pieces of scripture to reveal other things. And now here we are, kind of like full circle coming back. Well, this I find interesting because in Zechariah chapter 1, 7, before we go down a little further, we see that upon the 24th day of the 11th month, okay, which is Shabbat, you find out that it says uh, a man riding upon a red horse. He was among the myrtle trees in the bottom and behind. Okay, like he he's he's there, but he's hiding out. He he hasn't come forward yet. Okay, that spirit hasn't entered. Okay, that antichrist spirit hasn't hasn't entered in yet. But this is interesting, and the reason it's interesting is because when we get to verse twelve, look at what it says. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, "O Lord of hosts, how long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem?" And on the cities of Judah. He's not talking about all the people. He's talking about getting mercy in the land. Okay? Because of the indignation of it, right? Because they haven't allowed it to rest. Okay? How long, O Lord, will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these 70 years? Let me show you something. This 24th day of the 11th month, in these 70 years, is in two days. This, on the Hebrew calendar, this coming Saturday, is the 24th day of the 11th month. Remember when I showed it to you earlier? This is the 24th day of the 11th month. If I never showed this earlier, it, I might have been rehashing because I, I was like 20 minutes into a video before this and I canceled, I deleted it. So I may have said it on that one. <laughs> but you see, this coming Saturday is literally this date in the 70th year. <laughs> this It's starting to get real, you know what I mean? This is really, really real getting real. This is that time. Now, what does it mean? I don't know. A lot of people are expecting something uh, to potentially happen at the Super Bowl. Well, wouldn't it be interesting if something happened before the Super Bowl? I only make note of it because it's literally a date in Scripture in the 70th year of Israel, and it's connected to this guy riding a red horse, which we know will begin after the 50th day. Okay? And it's these 70 years. So we're still in the 70th. That's the 24th day of the 11th month. We come down here. We're still in the 70th year. And look at what it says. I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. The evil, the bad, the distress, the sorrow, the trouble. See, the affliction. And then he talks about, I shall build the temple. I shall be stretched. The, the line shall be stretched forth. I shall yet spread abroad. I shall yet comfort Zion. I shall yet choose Jerusalem. See, now affliction is coming. Well, if this was the 24th day of the 11th month, meaning there would only be a month and change left, well, that doesn't leave too much time left before the affliction begins. Right? 
this affliction now where it can get a little confusing is we say okay well israel's first day of the year is right here it's march 14th but that's not pentecost where the 14 years will begin it's not around closer to the may 14th which is their actual anniversary i agree so what could this be well maybe this is that attack time right Maybe that's the time of the first attack. Maybe it's not here. Again, this is speculation because this date is in Scripture. But when we see this, this affliction, this, this sense of affliction beginning based on the calendar, maybe this is that time frame Okay, for that first attack. This is, this is where when it comes to calendars and trying to say, well, it's this day or that day, it's, it, it's not the easiest thing. Okay? But it's the time frame. We're right in that time frame. And you can see the four horns. These are they which scattered Judah and Israel and Jerusalem. Okay? Now all, all the craziness is happening. So as we as we went through this now, we can understand this is the season and time that we're literally in. And when we come to Ezra, after having followed it from Second Chronicles and Jeremiah 34 and and seeing these attacks, you know, this covenant being made is the one that would probably come after that first attack. And then they're going to receive that second attack for having made this and broken this covenant that they did within themselves. And then what happens? Then you have this proclamation of Cyrus that comes about. Now, this, this gets really interesting, you see, because... This proclamation of Cyrus, <clears throat> and the reason it's so interesting is because when we go to Daniel chapter 9, we see it right here. You see, first of all, it says 70 weeks. Everybody likes to come down here and says, for one week. See, this is the seven years tribulation. It says one week. It means seven years. What? What? If 70 weeks means 70 years, and seven weeks means seven years, and Three score and two is a type of two and a half. Well, if they're all weeks as years, why would this one suddenly be seven? It's not. All right? This is literally Messiah when he comes back to confirm the covenant that he made when he was here during the first half of trumpets. But he had to cut off because Satan came down and Satan and his people were here for the two and a half years. Okay, we've covered this a lot. I still plan on doing a, an intro video for those who have been asking of Daniel chapter 9. But you see right here, there's your 70 weeks or years. And these are called like what? Shabuah, right? Which is related to what? Pentecost. Okay, 70 Pentecosts. So 70 as the 73, right? Pentecosts. And we see. That from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to re and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Okay, we know there's a commandment to restore, but it's going to be seven years before the actual building, rebuilding of the city and restoring takes place. Well, who gave this commandment? Well, that's what we were talking about. That's Ezra. I'm sorry, that's Ezra one with the the Cyrus, the king of Persia now. That's the whole thing from 2 Chronicles. See, the fulfill the 70 years. Then Cyrus is now in his first year. Israel has already had its attack. So it would appear <coughs> that Ezra 1 and Cyrus in this attack or in this declaration that they make to allow them to rebuild is at the start time frame of the 14 years it strikes me as being the end of the 50 days because we know at this proclamation that it will begin the 14 years it will begin the time of the red horse rider and it will begin world war three you following that's what we're oops that's what we're getting here with daniel chapter 9 this is that proclamation. Now, these 70 or these seven years here, 
So we know that they're not actually going to be able to build it for the next seven years. And we showed you that from, um, from Leviticus 26 because they've been disobedient. They're going to be removed from the land for seven years. But we find out in the midst of that year, a group is allowed to go back and build the foundation. Now, they're supposed to be able to build more because that's what Cyrus has told them. You see, this decree was to allow them to go. But what ends up happening? World War III. Nation against nation and pestilence and everything else. So they've been removed from the land. Craziness breaks out. World War III breaks out. And now they can't go back. Well, World War III settles. You know, there's still things going on. There's pestilence. There's famine. Now there's there, there's still chaos going in the earth. Animals are killing people too, as we see the, the time of the pale horse rider. But look what happens. You see, in Ezra, we have this word for mighty. And how I came across this was, nice cold coffee at almost midnight. <laughs> and how I came across this is, I was sent a, a video posted in the forum that uh, was from Leland Jones. I like Leland Jones. He has some really great details of uh, of the throne room and connected to the tribes and all those things. Different details of understanding than I have. Okay, mine is an end time revealing of the end of days ministry, plain and simple. Now, it doesn't only end up revealing the end of days. It reveals things from the past that are are applicable to our lives now as well like the baptism in Jesus Christ's name for the remission of sins and the receiving of the Holy Ghost. That is the way it should be done now, among many, many other things that uh, that apply to the understanding of now as well. Well, and to, to mysteries that have been confused along the way, like Christ's time frame of death and resurrection, which included from when he was taken, all right? All these different things. Well, with Leland Jones, he has different things. And the one thing that uh, I, I spoke to Leland over a year ago, we were doing a live show on another channel and we had Leland on, but his connection, his internet connection was really bad. So I, I had started talking and, and trying to get things out to, to put it together to him. And he was about to start talking and then we lost connection. But the reason I really wanted to talk to Leland is I think with what the, some of the many things he has with some of the many things we have, that if we put them together, he could help build the picture of things within the time frame. And what we can do is we could add the understanding of those times with the greater picture of the events into the more specific things within those times. Well, the, one of the main things is people will go to Leland Jones and then they come watch Ministry Revealed and they say, hey, you should see Leland Jones. He also talks about 14 years. Yes, but unfortunately, he still is the same as everybody else's. Let me show you real quick. Leland Jones talks about seven years and seven years. His seven years that he talks about are the seven years of seals and trumpets, unfortunately. So the seven years he's showing you is the what he what we would call the seven good years or the seven easy years. Okay? So he's got these seven years which are the ones we're coming to an end of. And he's got the next seven years, which he thinks is like everybody else. So he doesn't really have the seven years. Uh, sorry, the 14 years. He's essentially teaching in relation to the end times, the exact same seven years as everybody else. Okay? He doesn't have our 14 years. And I want to make that clear so that people don't get confused when they watch his stuff. He has the seven easy years, and he sees the next seven years as seals and trumpets like most everybody else. I would love to get his attention so that he can understand that his 14 are seven of seals and seven of trumpets. If we could show him that and connect the two together, it would really, really make a big difference in, in growing even more understanding. All right? So... From the, the video that I that was shared and that I had watched, he goes into the many, many Teke Perez, I think it is, 
which is the writing on the wall. Well, if you go to the words of the writing on the wall, they only show up, you know, three times, three times, three times. It's always there in uh, in Daniel chapter five. Well, he mentioned how it led also to Ezra and to the book of Ezra. And so from that, of course, you know, that's the way it works. You 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 hear something, you start going down a rabbit trail and you start seeking these things out. As I was doing that, I came into the first one here, which was in Ezra chapter four. Now, Ezra was, like I said, something I wanted to go into. And right off the bat, we saw in Ezra chapter one that it's when Cyrus comes to power and he makes the proclamation. So you're about to see, I started saying to myself, oh man, we might have something like these books. We might be able to find a chapter to year of events taking place. So I started getting excited about it, <coughs> thinking, man, do you know what happens in, in Ezra chapter four? Check this out. Let's go Ezra chapter four. We're in verse 12. Listen to this. Be it known unto the king that the Jews which come up from thee to uh come up from thee to us are come from Jerusalem, building the rebellious and the bad city, and have set up walls thereof and joined the foundations. We say, wait a second, they're already building walls and repairing the city. No, no, you're gonna find out they're 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 kind of exaggerating what they're saying. But what they have done is laid the foundation. That's interesting, isn't it? And I can prove that the rest isn't actually happening, that these guys are, are, are embellishing what they're telling Arxerxes to get him to stop, right? To, to get, uh, 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 was it even through Darius, to say, hey, we need to stop them from building. Well, you'll notice that the foundation is being laid. And it's in chapter four of Ezra. Well, that starts to get significant, doesn't it? Well, I'll show you it in a minute. So then it says in verse 13, be it known, uh, sorry, be it known now unto the king that if, you see that? That if this city is builded and the walls set up again, see nothing about foundations because the foundations have been laid. Then will they not pay toll, tribute and custom and so thou shalt endamage the revenue of the kings. So remember this story of, of, um, of Cyrus, right? He gave them permission to go and to rebuild. But we know for the first three to four years, they never were able to go and rebuild. We know the type and shadow. It's all types and shadows, guys. We know that the type and shadow is because the this beginning of sorrows. The tribulation years, the beginning tribulation years have begun. And so they weren't able to go back and build. They were all scattered and removed from the city. <clears throat> so here they are. In chapter one, we see the proclamation. In chapter four, we see that the foundation is built. You can even see more down here. Uh, verse 15 and 16. And that they have moved sedition within the same of old time, for which cause this city destroyed. See, this city was destroyed already. This is why the proclamation, of course, had happened. Verse 16, we certify the king that if, there it is again, the same if, this city be built again and the walls thereof set up, by this means thou shall have no portion on this side of the river. Okay? So again, what is it telling us? The foundations are built but the walls haven't been built, nor has the city. Well, that's very interesting when we go back to Daniel, right? Because what's going to happen when the seven years are over, the first half of trumpets, they're going to rebuild the city and the streets and the wall. So they cannot build the, the city again and the wall during the first seven years. But what do we know does get built during that time? Well, remember we said Zechariah. Zechariah's 14 chapters. They're the 14 years. What happens in the fourth year? So in the first one, they're destroyed and the declaration is going to be made. By the fourth one, 
the wall is going to be, uh, the foundation is going to be laid. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the house. His hands shall also finish it. You're going to see the plummet in the hands of Zerubbabel and so forth. Okay. What does this mean? When they're going to rebuild the temple and the city and the streets in the first half of trumpets, whoever this Zerubbabel character is, who will be involved in laying the foundation in the fourth year of tribulation, okay? In the fourth year, between that third and fourth year, which is why it's in the fourth chapter, okay? I would say it's that three-ish and a half year probably time frame. The foundation is laid. Well, isn't that interesting? Because in Ezra, it was in chapter 4. So chapter 1 is the declaration. Chapter 1 of Zechariah is the destruction, which would be followed by the declaration. In chapter 4, we know in the chapter 2 years, that will be then when the um, uh, uh, when the foundation is going to be laid in Zechariah. And it just so happened in Ezra chapter 4 was the foundation. So I started saying, oh man, this is going to be awesome. We're going to have another row that we can add here for Ezra. And it would be chapter one at the beginning in the first seal year. This is when they will make the proclamation right at the beginning of the tribulation. And it'll go for 10 years. It'll be a chapter to year that will go 10 years right across to here. And as I started looking further, I'm like, wait a second. Oh man, it doesn't work anymore. Because you get to you'll see as we get into chapter 5 and chapter 6 everything changes. But the first 4 years or the first I should say 4 chapters really do seem to have this type of chapters to year if you will. And how we can say this and how I'm going to confirm it to you is what I was showing you earlier that I said to remember because when the beginnings of sorrows are done, right? That the beginnings of sorrows and, and towards that end portion of those beginnings of sorrows is when they're going to lay the foundation. But that foundation needs to be laid before the Antichrist shows up. You see that? Before the Antichrist shows up, the foundation needs to be laid. So there's the beginnings of sorrows. And so right before this time frame of before the Antichrist shows up, this foundation is being laid. Because when this mighty king shows up, it's going to stop. And our type and shadow in history is then there's a whole bunch of people coming in, as we were just reading, that are complaining and saying, and saying, oh, they're not going to pay you tribute. There's a reason the city was all destroyed already. Don't let them come back and start building. Okay? Watch what happens. As we read this, remember, there it is. Uh, sorry, we were in, uh, in, in uh, Ezra chapter 4. We see that it was the foundation laid, but not yet the walls in the city. And then look at what happens in verse 20. There have been mighty kings also over Jerusalem, which have ruled over all countries. Give ye now commandment to cease these men, uh, sorry, to cause these men to cease, and that the city be not builded, and a commandment shall be given, and so forth. So what happens? Commandment was given to cease. And it's talking about mighty kings that have been over Jerusalem. Check this out. The word for mighty in Ezra chapter 4, verse 20, talking about mighty kings in that fourth year, that three-ish and a half year time frame. Look at where else it is. It only shows up five times in scripture. It's the Hebrew word 8624. Check it out. Daniel chapter 2, verse 40. Okay, let's check that out. Daniel chapter 2, verse 40. <clears throat> check it out. It's so awesome. 
uh, starting in 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. Did you see that? Who is that fourth kingdom that shall be strong as iron? Do you see the significance? Chapter 4, they, they get the foundation laid, but before they can do anything else, the rest of the building stops. Well, first of all, it has to stop because they're not allowed to in the seven years that the land is supposed to rest. But Zerubbabel and his guys were able to go in. Okay? But why does it end? Because the end of the beginnings of Soros is over. Who shows up at the end of the beginning of Soros, which is about mid-seals? The fourth kingdom that shall be mighty and strong. Do you want more evidence of it? Daniel 7. Verse 7, the word strong. Check it out. It's the exact same timing. What's the first one? The lion. The second one, the bear. The third one, the leopard. Daniel 7, 7. See? Sevens everywhere. 7, 7, 7, 14, 14, 7, 14, 14. After this, I saw in my night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, Strong exceedingly. Who is this fourth beast? You guessed it. The Antichrist. And what does he have? Ten horns. This is when that beast is given that power to continue 42 months to the end of seals. Isn't that amazing? That was found accidentally, if you will, or spirit led by the revelation of a word within Ezra in a deeper search from a word from Daniel that led us to show why the foundation was built, why they stopped the rest in relation to what had happened in history, but a type and shadow built into the the root of the word showing us the future. <laughs> That's it, It's mind-blowing, guys. It's so incredible. Now, Watch this. We'll go do a little bit more here in Ezra. I'll speed some of this up and then we'll end it. Because I wanted to show you that Ezra isn't all in order. It was looking really good. One, two, three, four. It was looking like, man, this is going to be awesome. All in order. And then I spent a little bit more time this afternoon and I said, no, after four, everything changes. <clears throat> we see here that we got Haggai the prophet and Zerubbabel. and it says in verse 3, Who hath commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? Okay? So what's happening? They're starting to build. And they're saying, whoa, 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 wait a second. This group is still there saying, well, what are you guys doing? Who are you suddenly coming in to build? And they say, you need to stop. We're going to go to King Darius. So you guys need to stop and see if he gives you guys the right. And it was made known unto the king. Then when he went in the province of Judea to the house of the great God, which is built with great stones and timber, is laid in the walls, that his work goeth on, uh, goeth fast on. Okay, so it's really moving. <coughs> and the guy said, well, who are you guys? And thus they returned answer to us saying, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth and build the house that was builded these many years ago, which a great king of Israel builded and set up. He says, but after that, our fathers had provoked the God of heaven unto wrath and gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldees, who destroyed this house and carried the people away into Babylon. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, the, the king uh, the same King Cyrus made a decree to allow us to come and build. Okay? Now what's happening? We know this was over many years. We know Cyrus had that reign for seven years. And in the midst of that reign, they got the foundation built. 
But then everybody came against. Well, now these guys are coming and they're starting to rebuild. And they call themselves the servants of God. And they're starting to rebuild. Well, now, obviously, this can't be in order chapters to years. So then when is this? If they're now starting to rebuild the walls and the city and stuff is starting to be built, you got to say, wait a second. What's going on in the timing? Well, I'll go back to Daniel 9. See, for seven years, they couldn't rebuild the city and the streets and the wall. They only had the foundation built. But when the seven years were over, we know the Lord returns, right? The Lord will be not returned as in feet down on the Mount of Olives, but is coming on heavenly Mount Zion, that mountain carved without stone that will become a great mountain. That's the mid trump. Uh, sorry, that's the beginning of trumpets now when they're going to start rebuilding the city and the streets and the wall, right? On the uh, and the temple on the foundation. That's when Messiah will be overseeing these things. So when you get to this, that's this point here, the beginning of trumpets. So who are those over that are watching? Well, they're maybe connected with the 144, the people that were brought back from the captivity. All right. And we see it's Zerubbabel and Haggai. You can go into that with uh, Zerubbabel. You can go into the into the book of Haggai and see about that as well. So we're starting to see this time frame <coughs> of when they're building and that it's all starting to come about. And it says, um, Ezra 5, verse 16, Then came the same and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And since that time, even until now, hath the building not yet been finished, even though Cyrus had made this decree. Okay? So where are we seeing? We're now seeing at this time frame of the start of trumpets. Listen to what happens in Ezra chapter 6. You got to remember, it's types and shadows. So now they go to the they go to King Darius and they're saying, look, hey, Cyrus made a decree. We're supposed to go and, and be building during Cyrus's time in that fourth year. We know of we know it's fourth year. They laid the foundation, a nice, strong foundation. OK. Then we see uh, the elders that brought prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and they builded and finished it according to the commandment of God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus, and according to Darius and the king, and Arxerxes, king of Persia. Now I want to show you something. Watch this. Uh, was it Ezra chapter, no, six? <clears throat> or chapter, let me see, chapter seven. To teach them. Yeah, okay, you'll see that in chapter seven. So in chapter 6 that we're in now, we then see in verse 15 of Ezra. So Ezra 6, verse 15, we see that, And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was the sixth year of the reign of Darius. Now, if you go look at the history, you see that it was uh, uh, Cyrus that was seven years. In the, in the fourth year, in that time frame, that third to the fourth, they built the foundation. They couldn't build the rest. Now Cyrus is the type and shadow of the time. Uh, sorry, sorry. Darius is the type and shadow of the time of trumpets. Okay? And so we know that it gets built in three and a half years. But we also know that Satan comes and there's some destruction. And that it's going to get repaired and completed at the sixth year. So what do you have? The seven years of Cyrus and six years of Darius, the 13 years to the end of it. And look what happens. There they are. They're celebrating the work of it. You go to chapter seven. Look at this. How do we know? How can we prove we're now at the end of the tribulation? Okay. As we go into chapter seven, you go into chapter seven, eight, nine, ten, guys, and you're going to find out that. It's the tribulation has ended, that the Lord God is there, that the gold is being brought. The gold and the silver is, is being brought as offerings unto the Lord because the, it's everything's been built. Yet gold and silver offerings and everything's still being brought in. But look at what else you get. For Ezra hath prepared 
his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. That's getting really interesting, right? To teach the people. You guys know where I'm going with this. And then to teach the statutes and judgments in Israel. Remember I said everything's a type and shadow? In uh, Ezra 7, verse 12, Arxerxes, king of kings. What do you think he's a type and shadow of? Okay. Obviously, as a, as a, what is it, a, an Assyrian king, you know, obviously it's not exact, but it's a type and shadow. There's a reason the scriptures told us he's called king of kings. And Ezra, the priest, a scribe of the law, God of heaven, perfect peace at such a time. Then you see uh, the realm for as much as thou art sent of the king and of the seven counselors to inquire concerning them of Judah and to carry, verse 15, and to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel whose habitation is in Jerusalem. Silver and gold being brought to him. His habitation is in Jerusalem. You are to teach. And as you go further down, you see more. You see set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river. So judges are being established in the land to judge the earth, to judge the people. And as such that know how to teach their, the laws of God are to go and to teach them who are beyond the river, meaning the rest of the world. So you've got teach people, teach people. You have bringing in the silver and the gold as free will offerings to God, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. You want to see what that means? Check it out. Remember Psalms all in order as well? Psalms 133. Oh, or let's see which one I wanted. Uh, Body of them. Oh, in fact, there's even a teach. Check this out. In Psalms 32, so this is in that end of that sixth year, right? That sixth to seventh year of trumpets. Of the fruit of the bo- of thy body will I set up for thy throne, if thy children will keep my covenant and my testimonies, that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit in the thrones forevermore. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. There will I dwell, for I have desired it. Where is, in the timeline, Psalms 132? Right there. When did I say the revelation was that we're talking about in Ezra? It's all after the tribulation. So it's the habitation of the Lord. It's going out and teaching. And what about silver and gold being brought to him? Well, if you go to, how about looking at it as um, <clears throat> as Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 14. Look what happens in Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14, we know is the 14th year. The Lord has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. There's a great earthquake. And we see that, uh, where is it, the destruction? In 1414, how about that? Remember I told you the numbers? (laughs) Zechariah 1414. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver. You see, how about something else? Let's make it a little bit more clear for those who aren't sure. Go to Matthew chapter 28. The end of Matthew is the end of the tribulation. You see, that's why it ends with the Lord saying, and I am with you until the end of the world because he's here for the millennial reign. But look at what he tells the tribes. These are the 12 that are the, the leaders for the tribes. He's returned feet down on the Mount of Olives, just like Revelation 11 at the seventh trumpet. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye and teach 
all nations, that's all those on the other side of the river, and teach all nations, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This is exactly what we just read in Psalms 133, that the Lord is going to teach them his ways and that they're to go out and teach the rest of the world. See how awesome that is? This is the, the understanding. This is the, the, the book being understood in Zechariah. Uh, sorry, in Ezra. To go and to teach. To bring in the silver and gold as the free will offerings to the habitation where the Lord is living. See? It's everywhere. The, the judges, you know, to set them uh, on thrones. In uh, in Lou, uh, sorry, in Matthew, I think it's Matthew twenty two, maybe Matthew nineteen, right? Those who were with him in the regeneration, in his rebirth, that they're going to be judging all the people. Let me show you just for the heck of it. We're almost done. I'm over my two hours again, darn it! But it's always fun. All right, watch this. Okay, here it is, Matthew nineteen, starting verse twenty eight. Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration, the regeneration, the rebirth of the messianic restoration in a rebirth? <laughs> I'm not going down that one. Uh, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in his throne, uh, in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, what did we say? Everything else we've just shown is connected to that final year when, when they're setting everything up, when the Lord is here. They're teaching the people. They're doing all these things that I just went through. And we also have the judging of the people. That happens in Matthew at the end for those that are chosen on their thrones to judge the people. It's so awesome, guys. This, how do we come to understand these things? We can understand these things because the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to first and foremost. When you have that first beginning, that first key that we show in that playlist, that is what begins to unlock everything. You start to see the, the, the context of, 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 of the conversations and you begin to realize who and when they're speaking to. It changes everything. The next thing that's really important is definitely the 14 years. So you can understand some of that timing. You can see where these events are taking place. And there's another one down here that used to be number three. This one right here. This intro to the end time chapters to years. When I did this, we didn't have everything we have on here now. We've added a few since then, all right? But you'll see that the, in the understanding of the 14 years, in the understanding to who the different groups are, you begin to understand who falls into the easy seven, the seal seven, and the trumpet seven. And as you do this, you start to recognize these same patterns of, and of, of events and these types and shadows of events within these chapters that are taking place in the same alignment, one after the other, after the other, after the other. But the only way you can begin to understand that is if you first of all understand who the Gospels are speaking to, the 14 years, why it's been missed and how it's been missed, and then all these other things will begin to open. You see, I'm finishing it up now. As you go into the rest of Ezra, you're going to see it goes into genealogy and it relates to the people that are coming back. Remember, there was a group of people that were gone until the end of the 14 years. Do you remember that? Those who, who, were, who were taken and, and put away in a place protected for the final time and times and half a time. You start seeing this group of people that are coming back. And they're praying for their safety and, and fasting that they're going to make their way back safely. But God is watching over them. 
You see, the hand of God was upon them as they made their way through the hand of, uh, uh, through the land of the enemy. And you could see silver and gold coming again. Also, the children of those that had been carried away. You see, those who were taken into the wilderness until the 14, full 14 years was over. And then the rest we won't go into, but the rest is about their intermarrying and and how they're they're not to intermarry, they're to remain within themselves, and because they're God's people at this time, right? This is this is Judah, this is God's portion of his people in the land at that time. Okay? Gotta remember the rest of the world is still going on. You'll see that too. Now you see the final repairs and things that they were talking about. Um, it says, man, if we if we ever broke away again, the Lord God would be so angry, it would just be a complete con consuming of us. All right? There, there's no more hope after this. This this is it. There'd be no more remnant, no more escaping. He would just consume us if we ever broke away again. Of course he would, because this is the end of the road. You see? Isn't it interesting? When when I read this, I see this with just such end time eyes that I can't even understand <laughs> how this was to be conceived that it already happened. You see, because they have, since Ezra, they've fallen away, what, three or four more times or two or three more times. So to think that they'd be consumed till they were completely destroyed, why aren't? They, why hasn't that happened? Because in the prophetic, man, this this hasn't happened yet. They haven't gotten to the complete end. See, because he's prophetic in everything he's saying. It's so awesome. It's just such an exciting time, guys. There's so many more things I can go into with that and so many other All trails right. and, and pieces and it, it brings us into. It, All right, hello, 14. <laughs> that it brings us into that really would, <laughs> it, it just goes everywhere, right? So, guys, I pray this blesses you. I pray that it, it's brought you into a better understanding of this season and time that we're in that's upon us, what's about to begin to take place, and that you can now also grow closer in understanding the scriptures from an Ezra perspective, perspective in revealing how it all connects in this end time understanding in its time frame so that you can build more and more and more in your understanding. I love you guys. I'm praying for you. I pray for your families. We appreciate you. We appreciate all that you do for us, your support, your prayers, your interceding. Keep bringing it. Keep sharing. And I will keep sharing no matter what. And we will see you very soon, guys, because we are here. This is it. I love you guys. God bless you. Bye for now.